Mike Pozzullo has a BA Honours in History from Sydney University. He's a voracious reader and currently is active in generously supporting the Kokoda Foundation, giving his time and effort to assist in the development of a new cohort of young strategic thinkers. I'd also like formally to acknowledge his support to the University of Canberra through the provision of an internship position for a current national security student at the university. This position inside Customs and Border Protection has been a great success and we're really grateful for your enthusiastic support. Mike, it's my pleasure to invite you now to address the audience on how the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service contributes to Australia's national security. Uh, thank you for that uh, exceedingly kind uh, introduction. Uh, we are very uh, pleased to have our partnership with this uh, university and we do other things with other parts of the university as well and long may that um, continue. Um, today I'd like to address in my second uh, of these uh, lectures and I'm honoured to join Duncan Lewis. I didn't realise that as, the, as only the second of the serial uh, repeat offenders. Today I'd like to uh, shift gears and address a different topic uh, than the one I did three years ago. Today's uh, talk is entitled New Thinking About Borders. Today I would like to challenge your thinking about the very idea of the border and as a consequence engender a meaningful debate about the contemporary and future states of the customs and border protection function. My aim is to encourage us all to think more deeply about that function and for you here at the university to reflect on what it all might mean in terms of your thinking and your writing about national security affairs. We are, of course, in the midst of a federal election campaign, and I intend to say absolutely nothing about contemporary policy issues and do not intend to comment on the respective policies of the government or the opposition. And in any event, my presentation today will be delib deliberately theoretical and at one level rather abstract. I trust, nonetheless, that you will get something out of these ruminations. Managing the integrity of the border is essential to the protection and prosperity of the community and the economy. The border is a strategic national asset and a very valuable one which should be actively managed and developed as such. How borders are managed can foster or imp impede lawful trade and travel. Border control points, systems and processes sit astride supply chains and travel pathways. The very design of these points, systems and processes can add to economic competitiveness and productivity by fostering rapid movement and border entry or exit, or they can detract from competitiveness and productivity by impeding movement, entry and exit and diminishing the efficiency of our national infrastructure. Fostering legitimate trade and travel while remaining vigilant for national security, law enforcement and community protection purposes, while also using border controls as an extension of economic revenue and industry policy, are not contradictory policy objectives. They are intrinsically inter integrated and connected functions of state. It is my contention today that insufficient informed public discussion and debate about the customs and border protection function is taking place within academies and think tanks, certainly as compared with like public agencies such as the armed forces and police services. For my part, I would very much like to see a circumstance where there is increased serious academic and policy discussion in Australia about the Customs and Border Protection function, and hopefully these remarks today will assist in that process. Today, it is my belief that in order to properly think about borders, we need to take a step back and reflect about how we think about national security. Please indulge me and allow me to start there. Today, national security is not solely concerned with states and their relationships. We have seen over the past several decades the rise of what some term non-traditional national security challenges, many of which are interrelated and cross-cutting. These are not solely the province of relations between states. Rather, they involve varying combinations of state and non-state actors. 
We have already seen the growing influence of non-state actors which are able to access capabilities, including weapons, which were once usually the preserve of states. Globalisation and the information revolution are affording these non-state groups the tools to form powerful cross-border networks. These are contesting the authority of states by acquiring advanced technology and weapons, including through global black markets, forming networks and communicating with one another across the globe, and arranging their financial transactions in the shadows of the global financial system. In the face of this radically transformed environment, which essentially emerged after the Cold War, thinking about policy responses to the new strategic landscape has had to change and evolve. The scope of national security strategy has been broadened and more tools of national power have been brought to bear on the many new arrays of threats and risks. Our responses to these challenges have had to become more wide-ranging and integrated because their causes, modalities and consequences are multidimensional and interconnected. One of the main consequences that we are dealing with has been the fact that the dividing wall between external security and domestic security has been broken down in many ways. State failure, for instance, in one place can affect states on the other side of the globe through people smuggling and irregular or illegal migration. The activities of large transnational criminal networks which operate from these ungoverned spaces or by way of terrorist attacks which are planned and mounted from such places. Similarly, supply chains and airline routes traverse many states, creating multiple po points of potential vulnerability and access for criminals and terrorists. National security practice itself is becoming increasingly borderless, or rather transgovernmental, at least amongst like-minded states. We see this in the increased level of cross-border collaboration in areas such as customs and border protection, law enforcement and policing, immigration controls, aviation, transport and maritime security, cyber security, and financial transactions monitoring, as well as, as across a range of strategic pathologies such as terrorism, proliferation, cyber intrusions, people smuggling and drug, drug trafficking, to name five major areas in relation to which transgovernmental collaboration is becoming the norm. Transgovernmental networks of government agencies are increasingly exchanging information and collaborating either in joint mission-specific task forces or by way of more enduring arrangements. Networked threats require such networked responses. Through these approaches, the reach of the state is actually being extended to deal with diffused threats and risks. We can see the interconnected and cross-border character of national security at work in the area of global trade and border and transport security. We of course rely on the daily operation of sea cargo, air cargo and international postal systems for our economic, commercial and indeed private prosperity. These have also become attack vectors for terrorist groups which seek to penetrate the global supply chain for the purposes of striking our cities, population and infrastructure. So any approach to counter-terrorism, which limits itself to reactive criminal investigations against these groups, and which does not also seek to secure the global supply chain through the creation of collaborative transgovernmental defensive layers of transport and border security, is likely to fail. There is a greater range of national security stakeholders today not all of whom are government agencies. The state remains the vital centre, but it does not possess a monopoly anymore, either on the use of force or the mitigation of the risk of violence or other adverse security outcomes. A greater range of actors than ever before are affecting and in some cases undermining 
the state's ability to protect the rights, property, liberty and welfare of their citizens. National security professionals especially need to be very clear in their thinking about these deep strategic currents and in particular the nature of the global order. Without a coherent way of organising our view of the global order, our responses to national security issues are likely to be fragmented and merely tactical. If a coherent view of the global order is crucial to our understanding of national security, as I assert it is, is there a con construct which might make sense? In my view, a normative and empirical construct which helps us to think about the global order is the idea of modernity. Modernity is characterised by the maximisation of opportunities for citizens and civil society. It has to be protected from its enemies by like-minded societies which are willing to pay the price for doing so. This is because modernity is the antithesis of authoritarian models of social and political organisation and indeed threatens them with the promise of civil society and the expansion of freedom for citizens. Modernity creates a transparent, rules-based order within and across societies. It entails open societies and markets, freedom of speech in public discourse, transparency and accountability in public and corporate institutions, the protection of universal human rights, the promotion of democratic practices, the integrity of legal and regulatory frameworks, including independent judiciaries and regulatory authorities, and the adherence to the rule of law to uphold liberties and rights. Modernity also creates and relies upon global interdependence and adherence to rules-based behaviour at the international level, from the resolution of trade disputes and territorial boundary disputes to the avoidance of war and the making of peace. Australia has long subscribed to the view that a functioning rules-based global order is a vital prerequisite for creating a secure, stable and predictable environment in which states, companies and citizens can interact to mutual advantage. An example of the benefits of modernity is the creation of well-ordered global commons which enable the movement and transfer across the globe of people, information, goods and money. These global commons are critically dependent on the operation of agreed rule sets and international norms. The principal global commons of interest to us today are the maritime, air, space and cyber domains. These form the connective tissue of the global order which enable the operation of global supply chains, trade and energy flows, travel, telecommunications and global financial transfers. In the maritime domain, the global commons consists of sea lanes, straits, canals and seaports and the international agreements and, and arrangements which enable sea-based trade to occur. In the air domain, it is the global network of airports, air traffic management systems and, uh, and overflight regimes and the international agreements and arrangements which enable planes to carry passengers, air cargo and postal items around the world. In space, it is the satellite systems which deliver communications, imagery, meteorological, navigational and positioning services to a multitude of users and the international agreements and, and arrangements for governing such matters as orbital slots and communications frequencies. In cyberspace, the global commons are to be found in, the f in physical form in terms of submarine telecommunication cables and their landing points, data centres and satellites and other information and communications technology infrastructure, as well as, of course, the virtual commons themselves. It's my contention today that such global order does not spring into existence as a natural phenomenon, nor is its continued existence preordained and immutable. Such an order has to be formed and sustained through human agency and practice. 
It requires the establishment of, set, of a set of rules and norms for managing human, human affairs across borders and widespread adherence to those rules and norms. It also requires mechanisms for managing those rules and norms and a means for ensuring compliance and, where necessary, enforcement. Without the means of compliance and enforcement, the foundations of the global order would crumble because when rules are not enforced, they are no longer relevant and the order they prescribe becomes problematic. Moreover, a rules-based order is critically dependent on there being a shared perception that the rules will be enforced and that compliance is required. Now, where do borders fit within this worldview? Well, borders, of course, are the legal delineations of dominion, where state dominion begins and ends. In the world that I've just described, rather than being seen exclusively as a barrier or a wall, we should perhaps see the border as a space where sovereign political units control the flow of people and goods into and out of their dominion. At regulated ports of entry and exit, cross-border flows of people and goods take place. At these control points, sovereign political units are able to determine who and what has the right or gift of entry or exit and under what conditions. The control of cross-border movements is one of the foundational national functions, which is exercised and managed for a variety of purposes, including the levying of duties and taxes, the checking of travel identity and intention, and the interdiction of illegal, regulated or prohibited goods. Now, having dealt with my topic at a rather theoretical level, allow me to come to the level of applied theory and see how all of this applies to the Australian border. We know in the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service that the way we currently do business and operate at the border will not be enough to protect the border in future. The increasing volume of cargo and traveller movement, the complexity of supply chains and travel routes, the threat of very sophisticated criminal activities, combined with internal challenges within the Australian Customs and Border Service related to culture, integrity and corruption, all contribute to the clear need for a comprehensive program of reform for the service that I lead. Incremental changes and tinkering at the edges just will not cut it. We need to undertake a complete transformation and all-consuming reform of the way in which we operate and the way in which we do business. Last month, at the start of July, we launched the Australian Customs and Border Protection Blueprint for, Re for Reform, 2013-2018. The five-year blueprint described in that document provides the roadmap for a root and branch transformation program which will encompass all of the service and will focus on three major tracks of interconnected change. First, it will deal with our people and operating model, building a professional service that is adaptive to change, with its core being the establishment of a new disciplined uniform, uniformed law enforcement workforce to be known as the Border Force. Secondly, we will deal with the modernisation of business systems and the acquisition of sophisticated border intelligence capabilities. Third, in relation to integrity, we will see the establishment and sustainment of a culture within the service which is hardened against corruption. Now, it is my contention that the service does a good job today, but I believe that we can do better. And indeed, we must do better given the challenges ahead and the world I've just described. The realities that we are, are already facing at the border mean that we must continue to take the initiative in developing new systems and tools, as well as the skills and professional competencies of our officers. I will not in this lecture give an, an overview of the entire blueprint for reform, which you can find online at our website, customs.gov.au. The blueprint had its genesis as an internal corporate governance response to the problem of certain workforce, culture and integrity issues within the service, which regrettably included the arrest last year and earlier this year of a number of officers in relation to serious criminal charges. Also regrettably, 
further action will need to be taken against other officers as a consequence of ongoing investigations, the details of which I cannot discuss today. Notwithstanding this point of origin, it is my belief that we need to approach the issues outlined in the blueprint in a strategic manner and at a national level. And that's because, as I said earlier, it is my contention that the border should be seen as a strategic national asset and the blueprint for reform reflects this. Our goals relate very directly to the nation's security, its prosperity, productivity and competitiveness. And these issues are clearly ones for the entire nation to consider. And hence my earlier call for serious academic and policy discussion about the customs and border protection function in this country. The future outlook for managing Australia's border is indeed very challenging. In the near future, before 2020, our border systems will need to cope with an unprecedented increase in air cargo volumes, as well as very significant increases in containerised sea cargo, parcels and other forms of international mail, and of course, in the growing numbers of international travellers. Sooner than that, by 2017 alone, we are facing a 227% increase in air cargo volumes, a 14% increase in containerised sea cargo, and a 24% increase in international traveller numbers. Added to this, the complexity of supply chains and travel routes has made our task so much more complex. The use of the internet for trade and personal consumption is also changing our environment in a very profound way. These factors taken alone would create a need for close, effective cooperation across national borders to secure these supply chains in the global economy. Additionally, however, our adversaries, those who are trying to breach the border, circumvent our systems, and who on occasion seek direct insider support for their activities, are quick to adapt and are prepared to use infiltration and corruption as a strategy. So as we seek to improve and tighten our border controls and capabilities, we face the reality that criminal enterprises will continue to seek new ways to move people and goods across the Australian border. Globalisation has converged with the power of the internet, for instance. This means that there will be more illicit transactions that knock out the middleman and bypass traditional organised crime structures. Today, consumers are already able to purchase illicit goods from anywhere in the world and have them delivered to their door. And organised crime activities are not just limited to illicit drug markets. Criminals are involved in a range of activities across the border environment, which include revenue evasion, tobacco smuggling, money laundering, people smuggling, firearms trafficking, and trade in performance and image enhancing drugs. The tactics of our adversaries are as much a part of the border environment as is the increasing volume of cargo and, and travel. And we cannot be blind to this reality. So, against this backdrop, allow me to sketch some of the key features of our blueprint as they relate to the model of the border which I outlined in the first half of this presentation. The blueprint itself is predicated on new thinking about borders. It takes the view, as I said earlier, that the border is a space rather than a barrier and is made up of multiple supply chains. There are also multiple actors in that space, the vast majority of which evidence, experience and intelligence tell us are willingly compliant traders and travellers who just want to go about their business in as fast and efficient a way as possible. So the blueprint sets out a vision where traders will increasingly experience a more navigable border clearance process, whereby the impediment effect of border checks is increasingly reduced for the vast majority of traders based on their willingness to comply and on our enhanced border intelligence processes. We want to make doing business easier and we want to cut border red tape wherever and whenever we can. We will work with industry to develop schemes whereby trusted and compliant traders who can demonstrate strong commercial security 
and supply chain integrity processes and systems will be offered different forms of expedited border clearance. Similarly, our aim is for travellers to increasingly experience a fast, seamless process using self-service and automated technologies and processes, with the majority of travellers moving rapidly through next generation virtual gates in the airports of the future. Equally, however, the border recognise uh, the blueprint, I'm sorry, recognises that the border is not like a taxation system or a system which can be regulated by a public agency standing afar. It is a live operating system which consists of the physical space of the border. Live operating environments, whether we are talking about the battlefield, urban crime zones or physical ports of entry, need first class command and control systems. For that reason, under reform, we will create a strategic border command. The command will have the national authority and tools to coordinate the flexible deployment of customs and border protection resources against risks to the border, with one exception, in the offshore maritime domain, where maritime border protection will continue to be delivered by the joint command arrangements that we have put in place over several decades with the Defence Department and the Australian Defence Force. Strategic Border Command will have access to advanced real-time intelligence, communications, surveillance systems to monitor and manage the border on an integrated, real-time, 24-7 basis. The command will direct the work of Customs and Border Protection regional commands, which will be formed on state and territory lines. In addition to introducing relevant command and control structures, we will also enhance the skills and capabilities, especially of our uniformed workforce. We will strengthen capability and leadership skills through enhanced recruitment processes, active career management, and structured professional development, such as you would expect to find in a disciplined, uniformed service. Staff engagement and consultation with other stakeholders will be crucial to this endeavour, and we are heavily engaged in this process at the moment. Sophisticated intelligence systems and capabilities will also be crucial to this future state. We are building a new national border targeting centre to better identify high-risk international travellers and cargo through increased data integration and improved analysis capability. The centre's initial focus will be on improving the services internal targeting processes and capabilities, and then designing a multi-agency operating model for coordinating border intelligence. The centre will deliver a significant capability boost and will build the foundation that we need to create a leading edge intelligence-led targeting system. A second phase of this activity will see the establishment, establishment of a dedicated facility to hold multiple agencies under the one roof. And this will enable joint planning of border operations, supported by improved cross-agency data integration and sharing. Through the National Border Targeting Centre, we will work closely with border management, intelligence, law enforcement and regulatory agencies with border interests around the world. We will work especially collaboratively with partners who already have similar targeting centres in the US, Canada, the United Kingdom and New Zealand. We are doing this because enhanced cooperation and collaboration between customs and border agencies is essential to both facilitating trade and travel and mitigating the threats to our borders that I outlined earlier. These four partners, the US, the UK, Canada and New Zealand, are our, are our most trusted international partners in terms of defence, intelligence and security collaboration. And indeed, last month, Australia attended the inaugural five-country ministerial meeting in the US, the first time that ministers responsible for homeland security from Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the US and the UK have collectively met. The meeting focused on issues of shared concern, such as border security, immigration and customs issues, law enforcement and crime, infrastructure protection and cyber security. Australia is also engaged with what is known as the Border Five, created some years ago by the customs administrations I mentioned earlier, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the UK and the US. 
to discuss and partner on customs issues of interest and priority. Through the Border Five, we are working to strengthen border controls, share best practice through joint initiatives and information sharing, and leverage partnerships to increase effectiveness and efficiency. Current activities within the Border Five, including the development of a roadmap to guide the group's future activities in five key areas, intelligence, integrity, risk management and performance man management, technology, and trade facilitation. As the current chair of the, of the Board of Five, we will play a key role in driving the work of this group over the next 12 months. Another concrete example of our international collaboration in customs and border protection was the signing last year by Australia and the United States of a joint statement regarding the development of a framework for cooperative international targeting and assessment. To implement this agreement, we have posted an officer to work with US CBP, or US Customs and Border Protection, on the development of a cooperative targeting framework which will enable delivery against the commitments set out by the two governments under the joint statement. In particular, we are seeking closer links with the US International Border Targeting Centre, as well as US CBP's two national targeting centres for passengers and cargo. In a similar vein, our relationship with New Zealand is a whole of government diplomatic priority and one of Australia's closest and most comprehensive bilateral relationships. Our service has a long-standing mutual strategic partnership with our key counterpart agency, the New Zealand Customs Service. And our bilateral work program delivers on the customs-related elements of our respective two governments' commitments under the Australian-New Zealand Closer Economic Relations Agreement. Our long-term goal under that agreement is the creation of a trans-Tasman single economic market, in effect, which would involve a seamless border. Now, such a concept, of course, requires clear mutual understanding of and an integrated approach to border risks. We are working with our New Zealand counterparts to exchange and protect sensitive information and intelligence relative to this mutual goal. We already share a deep level of understanding, maturity and trust in our relationship and a high level of compatibility in the way that we approach and manage border risk. These ties with New Zealand will only get closer in the coming years. Well, friends, we have been talking about the challenges of the border, certainly my agency, for some time. And we've been talking about the future arriving for some time. Well, it's my contention that that future has arrived. This, the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service will be transformed into the disciplined uniform service, which is assisted by an advanced, intel advanced intelligence and risk assessment platform, which is well placed to protect our country and support our industry while fostering legitimate trade and travel. Legitimate traders and travellers will be our partners as we work together to secure both our economic prosperity and our national security. Similarly central to this work will be the collaboration and the partnerships that we are establishing and will build further with domestic and international law enforcement, border agency and other partners. I'll finish where I started. These are not matters just for the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service. They are, in my contention, matters for the nation as a whole. As I have outlined today, the modern border is a strategic national asset and a crucial function of state which directly impacts on a sovereign state's security and its economy. Given the global economy, the international nature of trade and travel and of criminal organisations, sovereign states can no longer work in isolation to defend their borders. The new thinking about border control has to be centred on collaboration and sovereign states working together to defend their borders. Today, I hope that I have challenged your thinking on the role and res responsibilities of the modern service that I lead and giving you something of an understanding of the challenging environment in which we operate. And I hope too that I've stimulated a few of you to think about this vital national function in very different terms. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that um, you know, we're moving into a new era and as uh, 
no doubt you're aware, Aspie has suggested that perhaps the departmental and ministerial arrangements aren't really appropriate for this new era. Uh, where would you see them moving in, in the not too distant future? Uh, Bob, uh, as you could appreciate, any discussion about uh, what uh, we call in the trade uh, changing the machinery of government, or, or MOG, which is the, the acronym, is something that, uh, that I would uh, have to do in confidence with both my peers and uh, future ministerial um, uh, leaders. Um, I, I will say uh, one thing, uh, and only one thing, during an election campaign in particular, that I found over a fairly uh, lengthy career uh, already in the public service that machinery of government and structural redesign uh, can be important sometimes, and I've noted uh, with great interest the work done by ASPI, and I won't say anything more about it, so as to maintain a completely inscrutable and neutral posture on it. Um, but I've also found, and uh, going back to the days when uh, General Lay and I served together in defence, personal relationships and how people interact, irrespective of the lines on an organisational diagram, sometimes are not only e as equally important, but sometimes, frankly, more important. So I don't diminish the requirement f to periodically look at organisational design. It's an absolutely important thing to do. And to the extent that an incoming government of either persuasion might be minded to do that, is a matter that will be dealt with in confidence. But I just make the point that collaborating, working together, is as much a human activity as it is uh, an activity related to organisational diagrams. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Barker. Michael, I think you know who I was. Um, just two questions. First, do you support the idea of a separate, dedicated Coast Guard to help develop this uh, new model of... Uh, the border. And secondly, while you spoke a great deal about the relations we've developed with the other English-speaking partners, we didn't hear a word about countries much closer to us with whom we have major economic relations and who might not always fit into our notion of modernity for political, cultural, ethnic and other reasons. Can you tell us why we don't have more, why you haven't talked more about those other relations? Uh, uh, Geoffrey, uh and indeed, I know who you were and I know who you still are, so, so, um, uh, so I just thought I'd clear that up. Um, I have no comment at all on, on, on the design of, uh, or otherwise of a, of a Coast Guard capability. That's a matter for government. In such views as I have, I'll give um, ministers and, uh, and, other, and my colleagues and peers the courtesy of discussing it with them uh, before I discuss anything in public. Um, Although I did mention in the, uh, in the presentation that we've evolved a joint practice with Defence over several decades, currently known as Border Protection Command, uh, it works uh, very, very well in terms of the tempo that it's currently experiencing, the ability to deliver the results that it's delivering. Uh, I, I just make that remark, A, to honour the toil and sacrifice that, that, uh, that both the men and women on those uh, warships and those customs and border protection marine vessels undertake, but also the command structure that guides them and leads them uh, is first rate. I, I make that comment and leave um, hopefully sufficient level of inscrutability and, and uh, non-comment on the Coast Guard. On the question of working with other partners, uh, that'll be the subject of um, a future presentation in the not too distant future. The reason why I decided to focus quite deliberately on what, uh, again, we call in the trade uh, the Five Eyes Partners, uh, was to really make the point that um, as important as all of our other relationships are going to be, especially in this Asian century and all the rest of it, um, we, uh, the, the day uh, will be a very sad one when we don't recognise that over 50 plus years, going back to the Second World War, we've built a very, very intimate set of very close collaborative systems. Um, they extend to the most sensitive intelligence and, uh, and other capabilities that uh, are talked about in very general terms in public. Uh, but, and, but for someone in my position, uh, knowing what I know about those capabilities, you can't even begin to describe the value and the depth and the reach of the capabilities that, that, uh, that we're afforded through, that, through those alliance arrangements. So today was really about saying that um, yes, geography is important and the region in which we uh, are situated is vitally important for a whole range of reasons and I'll be saying more about that in the not too distant future in another presentation. Um, but uh, that, those, the partnership amongst those five countries is vitally important. And, and somewhat 
underdeveloped in this area, certainly compared to our military relationships, security, intelligence, uh, and uh, only now after some um, uh, getting on to 70 years after the Second World War, only now uh, the five country ministerial meeting that I referred to in my speech, first time ever. Uh, and yet we've gone through the Cold War, we've gone through all sorts of other um, challenges together and, and those ministers have never met. So an interesting reflection and, uh, and so in the homeland and border security space, uh, somewhat underdeveloped compared to say military and intelligence relationships. Um, just in your wording of changing um, your thinking of a border from a wall to more of a space, is that a lady alluding to a more uh, less defensive mindset and more engaged preventative mindset for threats to, to I'd the put border? It, um, that's a very astute observation and a great question. Um, I'd put it slightly differently. Um, we're already engaged in, in trade systems. We're already engaged in supply chains. Uh, manufacturing, agricultural production, mining, you, you care to name it. Uh, Australia is a very open place. It is globally already engaged. Uh, the proportion of our economy devoted to uh, trade, the exports uh, and import uh, um, uh, trends that we're all familiar with, flows of direct investment, movement of people uh, is what you'd expect to frankly see in a first world country located a long way from major other economic, other major economic centres. Um, and Australia gets uh, in incredible welfare and, and prosperity uh, from, from those um, arrangements. So Australia's already engaged. The question is, have we built or can we build a better border system that reflects that engagement that is intrinsic to globalisation? Now, a, country, a sovereign country is always going to want some capacity to shut down uh, a major pandemic, uh, a major biosecurity scare, you always want in your border system uh, what, what I call, and the staff um, uh, would, uh, would be familiar with my ruminations on this, the dial. You know, if, God forbid it, if Australia ever got to a situation where there was a, a lethal, uh, catastrophic pandemic health or biosecurity threat, you do want a situation where your border controls based on that risk can fairly quickly be adjusted, adjusted to the tight position. But generally speaking, every day and every night, they should be adjusted to the relatively open position so that people get goods and uh, industries get intermediate goods for their own production or spare parts can arrive or, uh, in my case, uh, family members can order voluminous amount of uh, goods over the internet and for it to be delivered uh, overnight. And then you want an ability to uh, protect the community without impeding at the point of physically stopping everything. Uh, and so that's where a combination of screening, physical presence, um, in some cases quite intrusive uh, intervention, in other cases rather passive intervention based on intelligence and surveillance methodologies. You, you need a, a multi-layered and interconnected set of tools because one tool isn't just going to give you that effect. But uh, we are, as a globalised community, notwithstanding everything I've said about modernity and, and the globalised world, still an aggregation of sovereign political units. So, you know, if you look at the UN and you look at the, the global map, uh, you know, some borders are more porous than others, but the entire um, world's landmass is, you know, with the exception of um, uh, the Antarctic continent, I guess, uh, are all under sovereign political control. A and, and it's a perfectly fitting jigsaw puzzle. So, so how do you achieve that balance between openness, so there's intercourse across those lines, but also an ability, which every nation uh, has got a birthright in relation to, to, to really tighten controls, particularly if, an, if, if, if a national crisis or emergency arises. So I, I, my, my response to your question slightly changes the premise. Very occasionally, the war might have to come up, hopefully for temporary periods, and, and I would instance, say, a very significant biosecurity threat that might, say, decimate Australia's agriculture. But generally speaking, you want it working more as, as a flow rather than a barrier. Ted Wright, I uh, have no affiliation support for being a POM who's recently arrived in the country. Um, given I, that I hope your customs experience was a Yeah, I could explain why my container hasn't arrived yet, but anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> can make a note. <laughs> the, uh, given the fact that anything that you do is given the threat is always going to be resource-driven, 
Um, do you actually see a day when you're going to have to have a discussion with Treasury over the um, collection of revenue on the small extra 200 cigarettes, etc., where you get to a point where I think the US Custom Service has got to, that you know the game's not worth the candle, you're spending more time and more effort trying to reclaim a smaller amount. Do you see that uh, a discussion in the future? Um, well, we already have policy settings that are set by the government of the day. Uh, I'll give you one instance. There's lots that I could use as examples to illustrate my answer, but I'll use the collection in this country in relation to goods and services. There is a, a, a policy setting. Uh, it actually goes back several governments. If uh, memory serves me correctly, it was set under the Howard government of the threshold being what is in global terms quite a high threshold of $1,000. That is to say, where the GST collection agent for the Australian Tax Office at the border for goods and services tax. There is a policy that goes back to the mid-2000s um, uh, and that sets a threshold at $1,000. Why is that? Because it, it is that issue of is the game worth the candle and vice versa. Um, uh, the Productivity Commission, based on a, a government reference uh, subsequent to 2007, had a look at that and said, well, maybe there is still there's a revenue upside still potentially to be gained if you're willing to look at the threshold, but the cost then of collecting that really needs to be looked at. That Productivity Commission report was submitted to the Gillard government uh, uh, some couple of years ago, uh, and uh, we're indeed part of a task force that's been um, publicly announced that is looking at that for a uh, comeback to government on the relative pros and cons of either uh, keeping the threshold but collecting more efficiently, changing the threshold, looking at the costs of, of doing that collection, which the Gillard government announced uh, would report to government uh, by the end of this year. So we're part of that. Obviously, I won't talk about our internal deliberations uh, because that's uh, not appropriate because it's still in a confidential stage. But to answer your question very directly, yes, the Treasury is involved in that discussion, as is as are the other agencies that deal with um, parcels, so the Communications Department, Australia Post, and um, we're having a very collegiate and collaborative discussion. To take one example of the fact that we don't just simply sit back passively and sort of watch these trends, we are engaged across different agencies to look at the problem. Th there is a trade-off and some jurisdictions have decided to go for one model, very low thresholds and quite intensive collection efforts and they've made a decision that that gives them sufficient upside to do that investment. Other, other jurisdictions such as ours tend to have a quite high threshold, but what that means is that you don't then have to spend the time and resources to, to dig around and ferret those uh, smaller GST collections. There is a balance and we're looking at it. Hi, thank you for your time today. Um, my name's Jess Mullins and I'm a student. I'll keep my question relatively vague, given your position on commenting during election period. Yep. Um, I was just wondering how involved the Customs and Border Protection was in the AFP investigation, and um, if you had any other comments on that as the well. The AFP investigation mm -hmm. into people smuggling? Yes. Uh, the AFP is the, is the lead agency for, for um, pursuing domestic breaches of the criminal law, uh, but we provide support through intelligence and other, and other means. So, uh, in some cases, a lead agency um, will be ourselves and, say, the Defence Department for maritime operations, in which case the AFP supports us. In other cases, they'll have the lead jurisdiction um, and certainly prosecuting or investigating and then laying charges which lead to the prosecution of offences against the Commonwealth criminal law are AFP matters, so we then act in support. Um, the collaboration, though, is very strong. Whether you're a leading agency which is supported by someone else or whether you're uh, a supporting agency uh, and you owe um, support to a leading agency. We work very closely together in the federal government sphere. Hi, uh, Chris Farnham, Strat4 Global Intelligence. Um, you mentioned uh, cyber as, uh, and the global commons and also as part of the movement through the border space. And more specifically, you mentioned the practice of, of uh, shopping, using the internet to shop overseas and getting things delivered. I'm interested in how the thinking is moving forward in terms of new technologies, uh, most specifically 3D printing, and uh, how customs is conceptualising the regulation of code and how uh, instead of uh, an idea is moving across the borders rather than a physical object, and wh wh what your thinking is on, on this issue. Um, just on... Uh, uh, take the question in two parts. In relation to uh, online uh, shopping, um, the goods still have to 
uh, arrive in a physical manifestation. Um, they'll tend to either arrive through uh, the air cargo system, um, so your overnight air freight express uh, companies, they tend to have very rich advanced data sources and that can be turned into advanced cargo reporting. Um, if we were to stop and check everything, 100% of goods, um, then the value proposition of ordering that stuff and getting it overnight would just simply di disappear overnight. So there's always going to be a risk trade-off in terms of either uh, high-risk geographies, high-risk supply chains, high-risk supplies, or indeed high-risk consignees, people receiving the goods. Um, so uh, technology there is critically important to us. Some of it is screening, um, X-ray machines and the like. Um, uh, we get uh, amazingly good results from a very uh, traditional technology but which we've bred and trained up, which is our detector dog capability. They are fantastic um, at uh, not only narcotics but also explosives and, uh, and weapons. Um, but some of the technologies that are now being applied relate more to what is, what is known as big data. So an analysing vast data sets, applying different profiles and assumptions about risk, chopping the data up in different kinds of ways, uh, manoeuvring that data into other data sets and seeing what patterns and uh, um, combinations emerge when you start to wash, uh, say, consignment data in the air cargo space with, uh, with other data sets that we have lawful access to and just seeing uh, if you can't focus your always scarce, because by definition when you've got millions of parcels coming and you've got X number of offices, by definition there's a rationing effect always going to be um, played in. How do you queue and task those offices onto a higher probability detection uh, than you would uh, uh, onto, onto other goods. So we're moving increasingly into big data, very sophisticated analytics, the sort of analytics that you would expect to find in some of the uh, classified intelligence agencies and, and uh, elsewhere. Um, the other part of, so that's the air cargo stream. The challenging part in that domain relates to international post, international post quite uh, rightly by treaty. There's an international treaty that uh, basically says as a community obligation that letters and small parcels um, under certain weight um, have got, uh, 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 in order to ensure global accessibility, are held at very, very low uh, cost levels and there is uh, virtually no, no, no advance reporting. You, you literally you write your letter or you put a small parcel together, you mail it off to uh, whomever and you put it in, in the post. Uh, so there is next to no advanced reporting, so different techniques have to be applied uh, to screen that. Um, most online shopping though involves uh, rather bulkier parcels and so postal agencies around the world are working with border agencies in terms of well, how do we get better reporting akin to, not necessarily the same as, but akin to the advanced reporting you get in the air freight business. And so there's some very useful innovative work going on there. Um, in terms of 3D printing, um, I can really only uh, offer at this stage because we haven't uh, yet formulated a position across government agencies to put to government. And of course, we have to wait for an election in any event for there to be a, um, a serving government. Um, philosophically, the border transaction, uh, in, in terms of the legislation, conceptually would be less the, the transmittal of the idea. I mean, intellectual property already goes around the world, you know, through emails and through computer links and all the rest of it. When a good starts to manifest itself, it can sort of be printed off. I think there is uh, some policy work to be done and potentially legislative policy work to be done around, well, is there a border transaction occurring as that uh, hot ink is sort of coming down into the, into the vessel and forming uh, the object? Is the border transaction potentially the acquisition of the printer? So in other words, would you potentially regulate and control not so much the expression of the material uh, through each individual download, but through the manufacture. And there are some border controlled manufacturing items where uh, they are either prohibited or they're regulated so that um, as they cross the border, that's where the border control occurs. And once you've got it lawfully, you can get on and manufacture whatever you want with the, the said good. Um, now, obviously, as things like highly capable weapons start to become a real prospect, um, governments around the world, not just the Australian government, are going to have to think seriously about, well, do, do we potentially control and regulate and indeed prohibit perhaps the, the, the printer? Do we look at the transmittal of the code? 
uh, and the download, or do we look at the at each individual item as they get uh, printed off? I think that there are some. Uh, I think best described at the moment as interesting philosophical questions there, all of which require serious policy consideration in the not too distant future. Thank you. Mike, thank you for coming. Uh, it's your second time back and with that splendid, masterly performance, it won't be the last time. I was really pleased uh, with the way you presented it. Um, some are disappointed uh, that you didn't give us the opportunity of some sport during a caretaker period. But really, uh, what a great approach. Students, I think you should take note. Um, national security, strategy, national power, the stakeholders and all those things. It's, it's what we're discussing in the current unit and I see many of you nodding. Uh, you're probably telling me, yes, I'd put that in my essay. Well, if you do put it in your essay, I think you'll do well. And I, I'm currently marking essays and so I can't resist myself uh, and Stephen as the Vice-Chancellor may have a different view, but I'm going to give you a high distinction for that presentation today, Mike. I think it was excellent. Uh, you've admirably met the aims of the National Security Lecture Series. The first part, you invited us to think about and discuss and debate what these issues mean to Australia and your discussion on modernity, um, really good. A again, uh, I'm sure many of the students would be writing furiously if they weren't they would take an opportunity to come forward afterwards and ask you to repeat it so they can put it in their essays. But uh, really well done. I'm thrilled that you've come back and as I've suggested, I'd like to see you back in the future.